once again one of those slides that uh, I like to use to remind me to tell you that uh, the central nervous system is affected uh, in poultry in uh, visceral or in Newcastle disease. We, we already talked about that. Uh, it is also a problem in avian influenza. You get a vasculitis. I think I showed you a slide about that. Uh, and then other diseases. Also, uh, they brought in coffee and orange juice. If any of you uh, feel like you want to go back and walk, just get up and, and listen to me as I talk. That's not going to bother me. Uh, go up and get some uh, refreshments, and we'll be glad to do that uh, as I go on. All right, the first um, disease I want to talk about is avian encephalomyelitis. Avian encephalomyelitis affects chickens. Uh, turkeys, ha it has been reported to cause a problem of uh, decreased egg production in turkeys. It also affect pheasants and quaternix quail. The uh, cause of the disease is a enterovirus that's in the Picornaviridae family. The uh, mode of transmission is a vertical transmission. This is an egg transmitted disease. The, um, the clinical signs that you'll see or disease that you'll see in uh, young birds is usually before two weeks of age. Uh, they have a tendency to have head and neck tremors. This is a photograph of a bunch of young chicks. As you can see, uh, they are flipped upside down uh, and uh, have problems standing. The, the thing that I tell my students uh, when I talk about uh, avian, in, or avian encephalomyelitis, it's kind of like those little Easter wind-up chicks that you sometimes see, those little flat, soft, fluffy things. If you'd hold one of those in your hand and you feel it vibrate, that's what this, that's what this, uh, feel, this disease feels like. So the, uh, the little fluffy wind-up chick uh, that vibrates, that's, uh, you can diagnose this disease. The lesions that you see uh, are lymphocytic foci in, uh, in here, the ventriculus. The proventriculus can also be affected. I'll show you a slide, uh, a couple slides of that in a little bit. Uh, and then also you'll see white foci in the pancreas, and that's also a lymphocytic aggregate. Uh, uh, and then I'll talk to you about the brain in just a little bit. This is the uh, unopened proventriculus. As you can see, there's uh, multiple white foci that's visible on the cirrhosal surface here. If you cut that open, you'll find that it, uh, it, has, it does have a tendency to bulge. This is due to an infiltrate of, um, of lymphocytes. The proventricular lumen is up here. These are the proventricular glands. These are the muscular tunics of the proventriculus. And you can see there's a basophilia right here. And at higher magnification, you can see that that is uh, composed primarily of lymphocytes, plasma cells, and probably some mononuclear cells. Uh, in the brain, you'll see a, a generalized gliosis here. It's characterized by uh, a number of small nuclei scattered throughout the neuropile. And with this disease, <clears throat> you have uh, central chromatolysis. Okay, central chromatolysis differs from peripheral chromatolysis that we saw with uh, Newcastle disease. Uh, in that, uh, with central chromatolysis, there's ballooning of that uh, neuron cell body. Okay, and then you get lysis of the initial substance. Uh, and uh, usually the, the nucleus is not visible. Uh, you can also, if you also remember from my talk the other day, you do not get a meningitis with avian encephalomyelitis. If you look at the spinal cord, you'll find uh, gliosis scattered throughout, and the uh, dorsal root ganglions also have an infiltrate of lymphocytes, and some neurons might be affected. Okay. This is a disease we see uh, here in the Midwest, and I'm sure it's uh, been described in other areas. This is a pigeon that has torticollis. It has, it's standing uh, on its feet, and its uh, head is upside down. This is uh, paramyxovirus 1 infections of pigeons, abbreviated PMV1. Newcastle disease is also a paramyxovirus 1. Uh, remember, there are about nine different serotypes of paramyxovirus. Uh, most of those cause problems in birds. Uh, the um, PMV1 is different from Newcastle of poultry, okay? It's, even though it's still a, a paramyxovirus, a, a one type of a, a serotype, uh, but it is totally different. If you're lucky, you have lesions in the brain. Sometimes you won't see those, um, and you have a difficulty even isolating uh, that virus. And from now on, I'm going to start looking at ear canals after, talking to, or after seeing Dr. Schmitz talk the other night. Um, but you do get uh, endothelial proliferation like you, like you see in Newcastle disease that we talked about. And then you'll also see a gliosis here uh, represented as numerous small uh, nuclei within the neuropile. So that's paramyxovirus 1. There's a vaccine available uh, to uh, help prevent uh, pigeon raisers from having this problem. 
This is uh, a photomicrograph, and I'm sorry I don't have any uh, gross photographs, um, of uh, pheasants with eastern equine encephalitis. This, uh, we had two cases of this last uh, summer in the state of Michigan. It does happen uh, in areas uh, that have high mosquito populations. Uh, if you remember, uh, uh, birds are not necessarily terminal hosts for that virus like uh, humans and, and horses are. Uh, you get uh, a viremia and replication within. Uh, usually it's within the endothelium, um, according to my reading, of, um, uh, throughout the body. Here it's characterized by vasculitis within the, uh, the uh, cerebellum, and, or excuse me, the, the, the uh, midbrain and cerebrum. Uh, and you can see you can, uh, massive numbers of uh, both heterophils and lymphocytes within the muscular tunics of the uh, small arterial within the neuropile. You can also see neuronal necrosis here characterized by uh, irregular shaped eosinophilic uh, neurons. The thing that, uh, the first case that I saw of this was uh, pr almost predominantly heterophilic in response. Uh, so even though you see heterophils uh, acutely, uh, don't, just, don't just think bacterial <coughs> disease, uh, and especially in pheasants, you want to think about uh, equine encephalitis. Diagnosis is two ways, you're right. Um, virus isolation is one. You can also do uh, uh, serology and find a titer. And at Michigan State, we have uh, immunohistochemistry that we made that diagnosis on. Uh, that happens pretty quickly. If you want to send us your slides, we'll be glad to do that for you at a cost. <laughs> I can't tell you the cost. Um, this is uh, a broiler chicken that's got its head tilted back. Uh, this is uh, avian uh, encephalomalacia. Encephalomalacia in poultry is due to a vitamin E deficiency. Uh, you can see this in young growing animals, uh, any chickens. Uh, we, it's also very common to see in turkeys. <coughs> A vitamin E, avian encephalomalacia is um, due to the vitamin E deficiency that I told you about. Uh, the vitamin E might be in the ration, but uh, sometimes birds that go through coccidiosis or some enteric disease, it cuts down on the absorption of vitamin E, uh, and then they show up with uh, this disease. Grossly, uh, this is the, the, the beak of the chicken is this way, this is the back. Um, these are the two cerebral hemispheres. This is the cerebellum folio cerebellum with its folia. Those normally have a nice uh, uh, leaf-like pattern or vermiform pattern where they stand up. Uh, at different stages, you can see little areas of hemorrhage uh, and you can see swelling on this one. And on the one on the left, there's actually uh, hemorrhage in Malaysia. Okay? Uh, so you can suspect that grossly. If you cut that in cross-section, you can see uh, within the cerebellar, cerebellar folia, that's hard to say this morning, you can see uh, pallor to the, the uh, gray matter and different uh, areas of petechiation scattered throughout that, that affected area. Uh, microscopically, the classic picture is one of swelling uh, and malacia of the cerebellar folia. To make the specific diagnosis, you look at very small vessels, and they are filled with fibrin thrombi. Okay? So that, uh, that lesion is uh, consistent with um, encephalomalacia of poultry, vitamin E deficiency. <coughs> this is an uh, experimental case of, of uh, mycotic encephalitis. There are two um, bacteria, or excuse me, two fungi that cause uh, encephalitis in poultry. One is Dactylaria gallopava. The other one is Aspergillus, and it's usually fi uh, fumigatus. This just shows uh, a normal uh, cerebral hemisphere here and cerebellum, but there's pallor here due to uh, swelling of that one section of the, or w one hemisphere of the uh, cerebrum. Ultra, or the photomicrograph, or histologically, you'll see numerous multinucleated giant cells with dactylaria, and that tips you off to uh, dactylaria in contrast to aspergillus. Uh, just with, with a normal hematoxyl and an eosin stain, you'll see some non-staining uh, strands or uh, linear arrays. These, of course, are numerous uh, heterophils that have infiltrated within that area. Uh, the heterophils will come in very early, and then it'll be a primary granulomatous response uh, early on and uh, later if the animal survives. If you do a uh, Worthenstarrier or silver stain, uh, you can see these long 
um, linear hyphae. The, the differentiating, differentiating character from Aspergillus is its size. This is normally uh, less than five micrometers in width, and they also do not have uh, bra dichotomously branched uh, hyphae like uh, Aspergillus. The other thing I wanted to tell you about, for, for size identification, uh, an avian erythrocyte is normally seven to 10 micrometers in length. If you remember, you usually use, I think, five micrometers for mammals. It's been so long since I've done mammals. I think that's, that's the normal uh, criteria in terms of, of uh, width. This is a photomicrograph of Aspergillus. And again, with the Worth and Sari saying, you can see these are a little bit bigger. This is not as high a magnification. Um, and then, of course, the dichotomous branching of Aspergillus uh, puts it within the Aspergillus genus uh, in contrast to Dactylaria. And uh, these, are, of course, are Aspergillus is also septate. I think uh, Dactylaria is also septate. Okay. This is a partridge. Uh, you can see that uh, this bird is being held up, but it, its head is drooped and kind of turned around. Uh, this disease is uh, ascarid migration. Usually it's due to uh, Bayless ascaris procyonis, the uh, ascar intestinal ascarid of raccoons. Uh, it's been described in about uh, all sorts of game birds. Um, it's been described in ratites, uh, and it can happen in about any animal. Uh, the usually clinical history I get was um, Susie had a, a rac baby raccoon that she caught last summer and we put it in this pen. Uh, the raccoon escaped over the winter and now we want to raise quail in that pen and now all the quail have uh, CNS signs and they're dying. And uh, if you're lucky you can see some changes uh, when you do a necropsy. The, you can see some areas of uh, hemorrhage on the cerebral hemispheres. Here the cerebellum is flattened and more than likely due to edema. The microscopic change that you see, and it's usually within the uh, cerebellar peduncle, uh, within white tracts, you see massive spongiosis. Sometimes you can see some uh, areas of defects. That's um, where the, the uh, ascarid larva has migrated through most recently. Most of the time, you will not find sections of ascarids uh, unless you do serial section of that brain. Uh, this is one that we did uh, serial section, and you can see, that as was described yesterday, uh, kind of nondescript uh, internal structures and then the lateral ali, which uh, help, uh, help, you s help tell you that it's a, an ascarid larva. Uh, so uh, even though you don't find uh, sections, you need to, uh, you, can, you can suspect it with a spongiotic change, uh, the history, and then uh, if you're lucky enough to find them, you can make a specific diagnosis. This is a uh, photomicrograph of leukocytozoonosis. Uh, Leukocytosome simonde is uh, a problem in ducks and geese. They have uh, schizonts that normally form in lung, uh, liver, I believe spleen, and then in the brain. These are megaloschizonts. Uh, you can see how large these are. This is not a very high magnification, probably about a 10, uh, 10x. The, um, they have a the schizonts have a tendency to fuse and form syncytia, and they are filled with these uh, numerous merozoites. So that's leukocytozoonosis. The uh, gametes, uh, the elongate gametes are found in uh, granulocytes or, uh, uh, or leukocytes, any of the leukocytes, and the round forms are found within erythrocytes. Usually you don't see those histologically, um, but you will see the, the schizonts uh, that you see here. Okay, that's it on the CNS disease. Now I'm going to talk a little bit about special senses. Um, this is a bird with conjunctivitis. You can see there's a little bit of a uh, exudate on the, the uh, dorsal uh, palpebra. This is a case of infectious laryngotracheitis. And commonly in backyard chickens, that, that can be the only thing you see is a complaint of conjunctivitis. Uh, other things that cause conjunctivitis are any of the mycoplasmas. And then you can have uh, at least in ducks, uh, pastoral and atopestifer can cause a conjunctivitis. And remember we talked about in pigeons, uh, chlamydia is uh, the primary rule out for uh, pigeons with conjunctivitis. Also in pigeons, you also want to rule out salmonella. Um, salmonella causes uh, conjunctivitis of pigeons. Uh, in, in chickens with fowl cholera, Pastorella multocida, I believe Dr. Porter talked about that the other day, um, you can get 
This is the conjunctiva that's sealed, uh, closed by this uh, exudate, and this is also swollen. Um, the, uh, the primary lesion is that of uh, swelling of the wattles, uh, but you can have just uh, the swollen conjunctiva. As a matter of fact, I had a case of that, I believe, two weeks ago. And you, or you can have the middle ear that's extended uh, like this and uh, is filled with a caseous exudate. The, if you open this, and I don't have a photograph of that, it would be nothing more than a caseous exudate, okay, of uh, fibrin and heterophylls microscopically, and you might be able to see the bacteria. This is a case of ammonia-induced uh, ulcerative keratitis. It's common in poultry sometimes. The, during the wintertime, people don't want to spend money to heat in this area of the United States, and so they close up the ventilation. The ammonia levels have a tendency to get high. This happens, I believe, at about 75 parts per million. Uh, here, there's a swelling of the palpebra, or it's called chemosis. Um, you can see that the cornea is uh, almost opaque, and then you see a little bit of uh, opaque white material on the surface of the cornea. I removed this eye. Um, this is the normal eye on the right. On the left, uh, you can see that there's an area of, uh, that's opaque. Uh, you, can't, uh, you can't see, sometimes if you hold it right, you can't see the iris or the pupil, and, and this is how I can sometimes diagnose this over the phone, asking uh, people in the field, uh, can you see the pupil? Uh, where is the white spot? Uh, what's the, is the iris uh, enlarged? And that's what we'll talk about Merrick's disease. Or uh, is the pupil open, but there's a white spot in there, and that's a cataract, and that's avian encephalomyelitis. We'll talk about, I'll show you a photograph of that. So anyway, um, if you cut that, this is uh, the eyeball that's been removed. You can see the corneal epithelium here is uh, basophilic, and it stops right there and is lost, and then it uh, continues on over here. Sometimes you'll see a heterophilic um, iridocyclitis due to the uh, keratitis in association with that. This is Merrick's disease, ocular Merrick's, was pr probably a, a good gross term for this. Uh, you can also call it a, um, a riddle lymphosarcoma if uh, you're asked on the boards. Uh, this is a massive infiltrate by those pleomorphic cell population of uh, T lymphocytes that expands the iris and the, the uh, uh, pupil is irregular here. To show you what happens when you remove, the, uh, this is again the normal one on the right. Here you can see that the pupil is irregular, the iris is very swollen uh, and enlarged by that infiltrate. That's Merrick's disease. And then this is uh, avian encephalomyelitis. This is cataracts. Birds that survive the uh, infection with avian encephalomyelitis uh, early on will later go on and form a uh, cataract. And this is a, a normal eye on the left. And then the cataractus lens on the right. There's also been described in uh, avian disease, I believe it was last year, uh, about a uh, genetic linked uh, cataract formation. I believe the author was Jim Render from Michigan State. Okay, so that's, oh. and then last but not least, just to be complete, this is a turkey poult with uh, panophthalmitis. This is Salmonella Arizona infection, Arizonosis, okay? You can, and if, uh, also you can have panophthalmitis with E. coli. I think I showed you a photograph of that uh, when I talked about coli bacillosis the first day. Okay, need to switch carousels if I can, please. We'll go on to the reproductive tract. This is a lousy photograph, but it's um, a classic one for infectious bronchitis. It's an old one. Uh, the normal structure is, uh, these are the, the ovary. This is the infundibulum, this is the magnum, and it goes down to about here where, where there's the isthmus. This is the uh, uterus or shell gland, and then this is the vagina, and then this is the cloaca. With infectious bronchitis, there's a segmental hypoplasia if birds are infected uh, early on. And there's a, an article uh, about 1976. Birds were infected uh, one day of age with uh, infectious bronchitis, and this, this reproductive tract, there's segmental hypoplasia, and then there's backup of eggs within uh, the, uh, the area of the isthmus. This is an ovary uh, that has injected um, ova. 
the, remember that uh, birds will uh, lay a, one egg a day when they're in uh, production. And uh, so this is the, the, the uh, normal stroma of the ovary and then these numerous ova of different sizes. The, with many infectious diseases, you can have an oophoritis. Uh, I think Dr. Uh, Porter talked about salmonellosis. As a matter of fact, uh, the most classic one is salmonella pylorum with those triangular shaped ova that are usually orange in color. That's the, the initial thing I think about. Septicemes from pastorella will cause uh, injection like this. And sometimes you'll see a uh, periovarian uh, fibrinous uh, deposits within the air sacs and around that area. Uh, also, E. coli can do that. Acute viral diseases such as avian influenza, uh, some of the viscerotropic velogenic Newcastle disease can cause that. So any really uh, septicemic type of disease can cause uh, an oophoritis. It's not specific. This is uh, a photograph of an internal layer. Dr. Porter talked about that where you get retrograde movement of uh, eggs within the oviduct. Uh, these are actual eggs that uh, haven't had the external cuticle put on, the uh, calcium uh, shell. They have internal shell membranes that are on and then there's retrograde movement and deposit within the uh, abdomen. This usually doesn't cause a problem until uh, it's space occupying mass and then birds uh, don't do very well and, and uh, die from uh, malnutrition. These guys lay forward too sometimes? Or not, not when they get to that state. Once they start to do that, that usually blocks the, uh, the ova position and then they'll continue to have retrograde movement. The, as long as the ovaries continue to drop those eggs, they'll go on down normally. They won't be able to be over positioned and then they'll have retrograde movement. Is secondary to egg binding or not necessarily? Mm, we don't very often see egg binding in chickens. Uh, definitely uh, in pet birds, no question. I've seen internal layers many times in pet birds that do that. Um, this is another uh, presentation of internal layers. Sometimes you can see pedunculated, inspissated egg yolk uh, within the mesentery. Uh, you can sometimes get fiber in it. The reaction to egg yolk uh, depends on whether there's a rupture of the yolk membranes. If those eggs are released into the abdomen, uh, that will, the yolk material will usually become inspissated and you'll find a little yellow ball. The student holds up and asks, what, the, what is this? Um, if there's rupture, it spreads throughout the peritoneum and then you can get fibrin deposition. As a matter of fact, uh, I don't have a photograph of this. Uh, there's a, a, a uh, gross lesions of egg yolk induced peritonitis. Uh, it looks like a, a fibrinous peritonitis of E. coli that I showed you the other day. The only difference is it's going to be extremely yellow and you pick it up and it'll feel greasy. Uh, and it's very hard to, to have a good photograph where you can be able to tell the difference between a, a fibrinous peritonitis and a, and a yolk peritonitis as far as I'm concerned, unless you find free yolk within the photograph. Hmm? They still show them, yeah. I know, I know they will. Um, so anyway, you, can, you have a differential and you find free yolk in there, put down egg yolk peritonitis. If not, put fibrinous peritonitis. And you still ought to get partial, quest, uh, partial uh, credit for that. Um, egg yolk peritonitis is due to many things. Uh, sometimes the birds are um, jostled while they're in the process of dropping that egg uh, into the uh, oviduct that will rupture. And uh, birds uh, usually are pretty tight in, in cage-laying facilities, and uh, it's very common to do that. Birds that are delivered to the diagnostic lab uh, can, can have that very commonly. This is uh, Dr. Macri's photograph. This is the normal uh, ova on the right, the, an oviduct. And then this is the cyst cystic persistent right oviduct. It's very common to find in, in laying chickens. Um, Nobody knows the real cause, uh, zeralinone or, or uh, estrogenic mycotoxins uh, are thought to cause that. Um, and um, I find it uh, at a high incidence of, uh, of the submissions that I see. Uh, sometimes these will totally fill the abdomen and, and displace most of the uh, abdominal structures. This is an impacted oviduct. Um, this is called salpingitis. Uh, the only reason you can tell um, it's salpingitis is the next photograph. It, you, this is just characterized by an enlarged, distended oviduct. If you cut it, uh, this is a slide I believe Dr. Porter might have shown you yesterday, where uh, there's a, an egg that looks like it's hard boiled, and then there's a, a large amounts of a caseous exudate within there. Uh, and the, the usual cause of 
salpingitis is infection with E. coli, and it's primarily an ascending infection uh, through the cloaca and up through the oviduct. Pastorella can also cause it, but I, I usually don't think of that as a possibility. To not exclude males, this is the phallus of a duck, uh, if you've not seen that. Uh, the old literature talks about prolapse of the phallus, or prolapsed penis in a duck, and they say that's a pathognomonic for duck viral enteritis. Don't believe it. Um, you can get prolapse of that structure. Uh, I've seen it with organophosphate toxicities, and I've just seen normal ducks that are brought in uh, that have that prolapse. But I just, I didn't want to short um, that structure. Also, it's that male structures are important in transmission of other diseases such as mycoplasmosis. Um, so, anyway. Let's go on to the um, renal system. This is an opened uh, cavity of the, um, of a chicken. This is the oviduct through here. This is renal aplasia, where you have total uh, loss or non-development of one half of the kidney. This is a normal kidney up through here. Normally, it should extend and fill up this renal fossa <coughs> within the sacrum. So that's unilateral renal aplasia would be a diagnosis for that. And it's a just kind of inconsequential finding, except for that bird. This is urolithiasis. The ureters lie over the surface of the kidney. This one is filled uh, with, uh, if you open that up, it'd be a white um, paste-like material. This kidney is swollen and pale. This is uh, due to urate deposits. I'll talk about uh, causes of uh, urolithiasis. It can be, uh, with this presentation, one of the ureters is filled uh, with that uh, white paste-like material. Uh, the, the kidney, some of the kidneys can have these little white foci scattered throughout. That's uh, urate deposits within those kidneys. Uh, or you can just see all of the kidneys that are filled like this uh, and swollen and pale. Sometimes you'll get atrophy of the blocked portion and then the, the, the portion that is not blocked will be hypertrophic in response to that. The causes of urolithiasis and um, urate nephrosis are many uh, in poultry. In chickens, uh, you need to think about infectious bronchitis. There are nephropathogenic strains of infectious bronchitis that uh, go in and uh, continually destroy the kidneys. And then you get uh, birds aren't, remember, aren't, aren't uh, able to excrete a liquid uh, urine. They lack uricase, and so um, they excrete urea. Sometimes when that level gets high enough, the kidney's not able to filter it. It'll rain out within the tissue. So uh, such things as dehydration, if you turn the water off on young birds uh, for about a day or two, you can have a whole flock that's affected with this. Um, excessive protein in the ration can cause, has been known to cause this. Uh, too high of calcium in the diet can cause this, or a problem with calcium phosphorus ratios. Okay. When you have kidney problems, you'll also get uh, gout deposits, and I'll focus primarily on um, the viscera. I'm not going to talk about You can also get gout deposited in joints, uh, and uh, Dr. Lin will show you that probably in this next uh, couple hours. This is the, the pericardium of the heart, and you can see these little white foci scattered throughout. Uh, that's deposits of urate crystals within the pericardium. You can have it over the surface of the liver and within the liver parenchyma. This is the abdominal fat pad uh, commonly, and we see that little white um, deposit scattered throughout. This is uh, visceral gout. And you can also have renal gout where you get this uh, swelling, uh, pallor to the kidneys. And these are the more normal uh, ureters, and they have uh, uric acid within them uh, to, to be normally excreted. So that's renal gout. Microscopically, uh, remember that urea is water soluble, so when the tissues are processed, you won't see the uh, urate crystals. What you will see is the mucopolysaccharide that surrounds them when they're placed in tissues. You see kind of a fan shaped um, basophilic material. This is on the uh, renal capsule. This is actually uh, urate nephrosis where it is deposited within the uh, renal parenchyma. This is what I see more commonly. You have this fan fibrillar shaped area uh, of basophilic material, which is the mucopolysaccharide that uh, surrounds that when it's deposited. And then it's uh, more commonly surrounded by large numbers of multinucleated giant cells. Um, this is a foreign body reaction. 
And then at a little higher magnification, again, the, the uh, basophilic fibrillar material where the uh, uric acid was, and then the uh, surrounding rim of multinucleated giant cells. Okay, I think that's it. Oh, one more. This is a G-Wizzer. Um, this is a, a goose with uh, pale kidneys. This is renal coccidiosis of geese. The cause is Imeria truncata, T-U-R-C-R-U-N-C-A-T-A. This might be a board question. So, just to be complete. I'm Mary Truncata, renal coccidiosis.